Katya, am I just want to check on Mike? Am I okay? Great. Oh, the, the mic is not for you. I will project. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, so, as Katya mentioned, I'm Katherine Elms. I'm on the investments team at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. And I know oftentimes we come to these panels and there are a lot of intros and whatnot. If you want to learn more about MassEC and what we do, feel free to talk to me after this. But I just want to jump right into the panel. Um, I'm very pleased to be joined by my uh, four panelists here, Matthew Norton, Ali Yost, Christina Karapataki, and Patrick Walsh. So um, I got the R. That being said, before we jump into it, I just want to get a sense of the audience as well. So can you raise your hand if you are a CEO, an entrepreneur, you work at a company that's a startup? OK. Uh, can you raise your hand if you've ever successfully raised an equity round? OK. Can you raise your hand if you're maybe in the process of raising equity, have tried, ongoing? OK. Investors in the audience. <laughs> Nicole's just going to take some pictures. Um, and finally, ecosystem support, so maybe accelerators, incubators, et cetera. OK, so we've got a couple of those as well. OK. SVB's here, too. Yes. So if you want loans. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that shout out. Um, OK, so that being said, let's jump right into it. Um, I'd like to start with 
Matthew, if you can take it away, give us a quick introduction as to who you are and why you are qualified to be up here as a clean <laughs> energy, clean tech investor. Why I am qualified, that's going to be a tough one. Um, I may fail that test. Hi, how are you this evening? Good. There we go. That's the energy we want to hear. Uh, I'm Matthew Norton. I'm Managing Director of Prime Impact Fund. Uh, we fund transformative early stage companies that could have a big impact on climate. Uh, and we do that at the formation stage, pre-seed and seed, uh, often in complete teams, and oftentimes when business model, technology, proof of concept, et cetera, aren't worked out. You might ask, how do you do that uh, if the risk is higher than what normal angel and venture investors might do? And the answer is that our source of capital is different. So we are trying to fund potential breakthroughs that could have a gigaton level impact on greenhouse gas emissions, but we are intentionally being concessionary on risk. Not on return, we're only funding companies that we think could be big, important, public, independent, world beating, but we're deliberately concessionary on risk, funding a little bit earlier and a little bit riskier than normal venture angel investors are. And to do that, we have matched our source of capital with that risk return expectation. So all of the money in our fund uh, is philanthropic in some way. Either it's a dollar that is from a foundation that otherwise would have been granted uh, to make a difference in climate, and it's a foundation that recognizes that technology, innovation, and development are levers to pull there. Uh, or it's a dollar from a mission-related investor who is a big boy or girl and knows they're taking on a lot of risk and is comfortable doing that in service of a, a secondary aim, an environmental or a sort of existential threat aim. Uh, my background is in traditional venture capital. I learned the art at a firm called Venrock that's arguably the oldest venture capital firm in the world, originally the venture arm of the Rockefeller family. Uh, we built a portfolio there of hard tech companies that did very well. My biggest hit was Nest, where we were in the Series C about a year and a half before Google bought the company for a big chunk of change. Uh, and why am I doing this? Because every Monday morning meeting, when I showed up with a true extraordinary breakthrough, uh, at an early stage, right out of a university or a lab or a garage invention, we always passed. And we always passed not saying we don't like you and we don't like your technology, but by saying we love you and your technology, come back in two years after somebody else has jumped in first and proven the case. And when that same person, right, then went down the street to Kleiner Perkins, then down the street to Sequoia and got passed on again and again, Brilliant entrepreneurs don't beat their heads against the wall forever. They eventually give up and go work at Google X. Uh, Pr Prime exists to change that. Great, thanks. On to Allie. Um, hey, everyone. Um, my name is Allie. I work at The Engine. So The Engine was founded out of MIT, although I like to specify that it is not exclusive to MIT. Um, let's get that out of the way. Um, so the engine is a venture fund that's dedicated to what we're calling tough tech. So for me, what that means is um, we're bridging the gap between discovery and a lab, oftentimes academia, though that's not a requirement, and commercialization in the early stage um, for things that are more deeply rooted in scientific and engineering breakthroughs. So we don't necessarily have a specific aim at only clean tech, but that certainly falls within our um, definition of tough tech. So we're pretty broad across industries, materials, energy, semiconductors, space, some life sciences where there's an intersection of bio and some element of hardware that makes it not really sort of fit the current um, mold. Um, our fund is, I would say, seed stage, um, sometimes pre-seed and sometimes series A, so we often overlap with yeah. both of the folks next to me. Um, and our fund is, um, has a longer lifetime than traditional venture capital. So our fund has a lifetime of up to 18 years, which allows us to take on the risk at the early stage such that you know it's more aligned with how long it might take some of these companies um, to get to market. Um, in addition to the fund, we have a bunch of other services that are de dedicated to try to remove <coughs> friction for what's special about these types of companies. So um, I think uh, the biggest thing is access to more to labs, facilities, and capital intensive equipment. So I think um, if you're a young company and you're only raising two or three million, you don't want to spend a third of that on a mass spectrometer. Um, and I think tr 
traditionally you go from being in academia and having access to any tool you could possibly imagine to suddenly having access to none of it as an entrepreneur. Um, and so we're building out a centralized access um, to these types of equipment across Boston through the different academic institutions um, so that startups can use them on a fee for use. We also have physical space located in Cambridge. Um, and then in addition to that, we're building out um, program that's dedicated specifically to the types of challenges that tough tech endures, whether it be on supply chain and manufacturing, things like that. And then also trying to build out um, a network of tough tech corporates and tough tech founders, I think, um, to bring better connectivity across the two, because I think <coughs> tough tech in particular relies heavily on you know corporates for pilot testing, customer discovery, things like that. Um, but also, I think in general, it's hard being a founder, but it's even more lonely, I think, being a tough tech founder. And I think building a community is super important for, for that type of thing. Um, so why I work at the engine, I'm a scientist by background. So um, I got indoctrinated into the startup cult at MIT and went to work at a friend's company that was a spin out out of PhD research called Axion Systems, um, which builds ion engines based on MEMS fabrication. Um, and when I was there, I just sort of felt like I lived the problem of trying to raise money when you're a space startup, trying to call my friends that still had access to labs so I could come in at night, try and get an experiment done. Um, so we're trying to kind of build scalability for these types of endeavors. So, so uh, hi, everyone. I'm Christina Garabadeki. I work at Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Uh, so BV is a $1 billion fund that was started about two years ago uh, by high net worth individuals and championed by, by Bill Gates to invest in technology companies that can significantly reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the way we're setting up the fund is with people that both have investment but also operational experience. So they have been founders themselves. They, they set up companies. They did fundraising. They did BISD business development and that's because we, we recognize that tough tech or energy companies uh, are going to need uh, both a lot of time and patient capital but also a lot of support and we're trying to set up an organization that has the capabilities to, to step in and, and help those companies in, uh, during the various stages so pilot programming, sales acquisitions, development with strategic and that's where a lot of our company building expertise uh, comes in. Uh, in terms of stage, we go from, uh, we, we're stage agnostic, we've invested across the board, but most of our companies are on seed, series A, or series B, and that's why where we interact with the colleagues uh, on my side. Uh, and typical check size are from, from seed stage investments of a few hundred thousand dollars uh, all the way to 15 or 20 million dollar checks on the, the more mature uh, later stage, later stage startups. We have five areas that we invest in. That's electricity, manufacturing, agriculture, buildings, and transportation. All with the goal of looking at significant emission reduction on the order of half a gigaton per year if the technology was, was fully adopted. So trying to go after the, the large emission reductions and large problems that can make a change. Um, team is based in Boston and San Francisco. Uh, has grown rapidly throughout this year. And I guess w why I'm doing this, uh, I'm a chemical engineer by background. Uh, after graduation, I worked in the energy industry and innovation groups in, in large corporate in, in Houston. Uh, and uh, I was always interested to be, uh, I, I recognize energy is a big problem, and I wanted to be more in the company building phase of, of investing early, taking an ownership and it, it working side by side with the entrepreneur to actually build the business and then partner with large corporates. So that's that's a conduit that I want to be. And uh, I, I think this is an important problem in our lifetime that we need to be working on. So that's why I'm doing this. So if you haven't noticed, we're going stage by stage, getting a little later as we go, because Patrick got on the phone during panel prep call and said, nobody can talk to me unless we've already talked to everyone else. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm kind of the odd duck here. Um, I'm Patrick Walsh. I'm with uh, National Grid Partners, the recently announced uh, uh, corporate venture arm of National Grid. Um, they have announced a $250 million uh, corporate venturing fund. Uh, they have about... Um, they're stage agnostic. We, we have a seed uh, capability that's um, 
in the 300 to you know less than a million kind of range, um, and we have a corporate venture check size in the five to 20 range. Probably Series B, C is the sweet spot for for that corporate venture uh, team. Um, we're looking for investments that align with the National Grid's uh, objectives to uh, to uh, decarbonize. I think decentralization is a, a, a big trend in the uh, energy industry right now, and uh, and digitization of everything. So, uh, so smart cities, uh, smart vehicles, smart charging for smart vehicles, uh, smart grids. Um, we could probably use smart in front of everything. And, uh, my background is uh, from the computer industry where everything's dumb, but we're making it smart. And um, I spent 12 years with Intel Capital uh, investing in uh, a number of companies in the IT space uh, and had exits to Sony and Microsoft and EMC and Samsung and others. Um, and uh, joined, I joined National Grid because it's a, I think it's an exciting time in energy. And I think there's a, uh, we're at a point when where uh, energy companies really have to uh, make choices about what they're going to be in the future as we design a, a new energy infrastructure, and that's uh, that's what I find most exciting about about working in this space. Great. Well, um, before we proceed, I just want to clarify, in case anyone does have questions down the line, we do have question cards that folks can write on um, that will be circulated. So feel free to write questions along the way so you don't forget them. Um, but Patrick, that was a great segue into why energy and why clean energy, why clean tech, and why it's so hard to raise capital in this space. So can you speak to, and this goes for the whole panel, unique challenges in the clean energy, in the clean tech space that makes this sector harder to raise venture capital in? I have strong opinions about this matter. <laughs> uh, you know, look, you know, how, how does the world work? Uh, you know, the world works on risk-weighted returns. Uh, and what's the benchmark for risk-weighted returns? Well, it's if you put a buck into the stock market and you bought the market, uh, you know, over an average 20-year period of time, what would happen? And the answer is you would get about 8% annual return compound. It's what just history would tell you, right? Um, as soon as you start deviating from that, you know, either by increasing the risk level or decreasing the return or, you know, inserting something else that's a surprise, you get changes. Um, and one of the things that, you know, you tend to get as a triple whammy in energy and environment is three things. More time, more money, and more risk. You know, more time, uh, what, you know, use Instagram as an example, right? You know, bought for a billion dollars three years into its life. Uh, with 15 employees and about $13 million invested. It's, it's, uh, it's possible, you know, theoretically possible, but unlikely if you're developing something that hurts when you drop it on your foot. You know, whether it's an ionic propulsion system or a battery module or a plant that turns cellulose into fuel, uh, that you're going to be there with proof points and, you know, evidence of EBITDA and real value in three or four years. The time's going to be longer. Um, the second one is more money. Just facts of life. Uh, you know, there are examples of capital efficient companies that have gotten to interesting outcomes in energy and environment, and may you be them. Uh, you know, but their proportion of the whole is smaller. Uh, if you look at the amount of money it takes for solar, it took 150 million bucks. Tesla took about 350 million, you know, of equity plus an equivalent amount of government backed debt. It's just more money, right? And you might look at that and say, well, that's not true. You know, IT companies take a lot of money. Groupon raised $700 million. That's true but they raised a relatively small amount of money before they knew if they got it. Their model worked in Chicago, and then they raised hundreds of millions of dollars to make it work in New York and Austin and San Francisco and Berlin and Shanghai. It's kind of a different thing when it takes several hundred million dollars to know if your first big cellulose to fuel plant's gonna work. And then the third thing is, is more risk, right? If you think about a good venture capital risk curve, let me do this from your perspective. A little <laughs> plot here. Um, the the x-axis is time or money. The y-axis is risk, right? A good venture risk curve is super concave. So the first dollars in retire a disproportionate amount of risk. And then after that, you're kind of sailing. I think in categories like this, the curve initially, like you retire some technical risk and you're super psyched, but you may ultimately be competing in a commodity market, whether that's commodity kilowatt hours or cubic meters of water or something else. And that depends on your price level, right? So you got this long walk in the woods before then your risk curve goes down. When it goes down, 
God, you can have a big and powerful and difficult to dislodge company. Look at Tesla, look at First Solar, look at Solar City. You know, these are really valuable franchises that have super high switching barriers. They're really difficult to dislodge, but it's a longer haul to get there. And those three things, I think, you know, that, that's the nut in some way that I think all of us are trying to crack. I also think there's an element, too, of, like, if you build an energy company, it lives in a very complex system with mm. regulatory policy barriers. I think, you know, you don't, even if you succeed in building your thing, you don't want to be all dressed up for the party with nowhere to go. And so there's a lot of other elements at play where I think the really savvy entrepreneurs know that and are kind of pulling the strings, but it's a lot more work than just building a consumer product, so, so to speak, where you know who your end customer is and how to get there. You know, Ali, I, I was at the Tough Tech Conference, and you were there, and uh, there was a lot of angst in that room about why we aren't, uh, why Tough Tech isn't software and why it isn't pharma. You know, the rinse and repeat uh, yeah. t and J sale in Boston and the uh, Valley, you know, app through the roof. Uh, uh, for mobile uh, in, in software. Um, and, you know, I, th I think we fail to, to think about how long it took to get to where we are. If you take something like AI, which is sought now, or you take something like speech recognition, um, I worked for Intel for almost 40 years. I uh, um, deployed speech recognition systems in 1987 at Ford Motor Company. I invested in pure speech in Boston with uh, Ben Chigie and Jamie Goldstein and Russ Wilcox in 1997. And uh, the demo was, was amazing. My seven-year-old niece uh, met Shelley, the speech uh, uh, assistant. And two years later, she came back, and my laptop was closed sitting on my desk. And she said, is Shelley still there? And it was just like a, one of those moments where you kind of go, really? Um, and the demo, well, Samsung is still doing it at CES every year. It's the unified <laughs> messaging demo on the front of your refrigerator with the big screen. Tesla's still doing it in the car now, but you know, um, it's, uh, it's still a, uh, it's the cloud that, that really gave us the power to, to bring neural nets online and, and do what uh, needed to be done with speech recognition. And I think AI is in the same, it took 50, 60 years to get us to where we are with machine learning right now. So a lot of these problems are, you know, space race class problems. And, and, you know, so I think government funding is something we shouldn't ignore. Uh, and as a, you know, back to the risk reward uh, uh, scenario, I like uh, non dilutionary funding. So, uh, you know, that might be, uh, but it does feel like a lot of the problems are, are space race class problems that maybe the EV can take on. Yeah, uh, I mean, s something to add is as to this technology development cycles that we see with all of our energy hardware companies. It, it takes a lot of iteration, and, and you need to not only go through that, but also know what are the key requirements in every specific customer that you're going to go after. And, and most likely, the, the large corporates that you need to work on at the end have different specifications. I remember in, in my old job, we looked at, used to look at the sensors or materials, and, and they we used to ask the companies, how, how much testing have you done? And they would say, 30 hours. And we'd say, OK, when can you do 60? Is six continuous months? Because uh, that's, that's the kind of reliability validation you need to show. And, and, and that, that kind of timeline that you need to go through to get to the commercial product is, is, is part of the challenge of energy. So I'm hearing long timelines. I'm hearing lots of capital needed. I'm hearing lots of risk that might not be palpable to a lot of investors unless they're the special kind that Matthew has over <laughs> Prime. So what is the role of government funding, of non-dilutive grant funding? Well, I, think the, I think the piece that uh, the precursor technologies, sort of the, the cloud uh, availability, the government, uh, Al Gore didn't invent the internet, you know. Mm -hmm. the, but ARPANET was with us, in the, uh, and ARPANET was in the uh, you know, 70s, so we, uh, we had immense government funding behind us in the software industry. In, in pharma, uh, you know, we, uh, computational biology and, and drug design required IT, required, uh, you know, uh, programs to be uh, perfected and uh, supercomputers to actually crank that stuff. And then you could iterate multiple times. So precursor technologies, I think, is really uh, what the government is really good at and trying to uh, figure out um, uh, I think trying to align those uh, is a uh, 
you know, National Science Foundation kind of uh, effort that we should embark on as a, as a country. Going back to the risk curve that Matthew is saying, a, a lot of the companies need to go to the, the early stage of, of high risk that occur during the very small number of money. And, and a lot of the, the startups that BV has invested in have, have raised non-dilutive funding from, from government agencies and NSF and SBIRs to get to the point where a Series A investor would, would come in and take the, the remainder of the risk. And even later, I mean, we tell all of our CEOs you should have at least one or two government funding programs that you're targeting for at least the first three years of your life as a startup, right? Because uh, that's, that's an incredibly useful source to, to get you more runway uh, and more time. So we, we keep pressing our, our CEOs to continually be thinking about that. The trap in government funding is the Incutel trap. It's the, uh, they fund you for part of your project and they tell you to go see someone in the venture capital world to fund the rest of it. And uh, so you really can't do that and come up with a product market fit, right, you know, repeatable sale. You generally end up with a product that's only servicing a, uh, an a, a three letter acronym uh, agency and you spent somebody else's money to get there. So that's not the good kind of government funding. And Ali, I know you had mentioned your prior experience kind of raising capital and seeing the value of public-private partnerships. Yeah, I think, so at Axion, um, they are currently a Series B level company. They actually just successfully launched two um, propulsion units in space, but um, they've raised something on the order of 20 million to date, but half of that is through government funding. And I think where it works really well is um, for things you know you're going to do anyways. Um, and so for some level of technology development, for some level of milestones that is in your plan already, but I think um, where venture money or other sources of capital can be helpful is like when you need the flexibility to step on the gas and do things mm. at, the, at the pace and at the you know, milestone um, frequency that you need as a company. Um, I think the pairing of those two is really effective. I think sometimes the time cycles of just the non-dilutive money can um, pull your resources away from some priorities. Um, I think, I also think there is an element of, um, the accounting is, in, is not insignificant. <laughs> yeah, <that's good>. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think, I think, so for something like $200,000, perhaps, you, I think you should do a cost benefit, but like when the capital is large enough um, to take on the burden of a lot of the, you know, back-end work, I think it can be really helpful, but I think um, design your roadmap and then find non-dilutive money that, you know, enhances that as opposed to kind of shooting for something that is a little bit ancillary to what you would be doing mm -hmm. anyway. So let's say it is the right time to raise dilutive capital. You want to approach an investor. Uh, let's get into the nitty gritty, which I'm sure some of our entrepreneurs want to know. What's the right way to get in touch with an investor? Wh how, you know, how do you want to get to know them and receive materials from them? How do they get on your radar? How can they be more than just you know some noise in your ear or coming through your email? So what I wish when I was you know raising money for a company a um, long time back, somebody would have told me, is what it looks like from the other side of the table, right? And you know, to give you the math as like a, a, a newly minted, uh, you know, learning it investor at Venrock, I talk to probably three new teams a week, so about 150 a year. Uh, I put uh, you know probably one thing a month in front of our, our small sector group, so probably 12 of those. We're down by 10x. Uh, you know, I put one of those in front of the full partnership, maybe a quarter. So now we're down to like four, and I got one investment done in my first year. So there was like 150 to 1 <laughs> ratio. And you know, the things that I was seeing were all interesting things. And because you know, I, I have like founder empathy, and I really want to be able to do all of them, but there's no what possible way I can. I'm sitting there looking for how, what, are, what are ways to quickly get something off, right? Sort of you know, quickly figure out that this is not, not the droid we're looking for and move on. So I think if you're an entrepreneur and you recognize that, uh, you realize that you have to punch above your weight somehow. And the best analogy I've ever heard for this is a behavior, trust me, this analogy is going to make sense, a behavior you see in gazelles on the African savanna called stotting, 
Uh, you know, in herd animals, they typically have these like circular movements because all the animals want to be on the inside of the herd so they don't get picked off. But in gazelles, you get this weird thing where like a handful of gazelles will go off to the edge and jump up and down vertically. And they tend to do this more often when there is a predator nearby. And you might ask yourself, what are they doing? They're signaling. They're saying, I am so fit and so fast. You go ahead and try it, lion. You will never catch me. I will jump in the air to give you a head start. That's how awesome I am. And it's an unfakeable signal. You can't make it up or you are dinner for the lion. And I think that really extraordinary entrepreneurs find ways to differentiate themselves. The simplest way of that that I think everybody would tell you is crucial is some kind of warm introduction. If you're trying to demonstrate that I can connect with people, I can communicate with them, I can develop you know, sort of empathy and relationships, the best way to do that is to have some warm introduction to the investor. But after that, it's something big that you wouldn't normally expect. That could be the person on the advisory board who you wouldn't anticipate would be there, who ought to know better. It could be the customer who signed some conditional letter of intent, conditionalized to hell. Like, you know, if you achieve these things in this time frame, I would buy this many at this price. But something there that's validation from someone else. You know, it could be the board member or the angel investor that speaks in a way that means something bigger than just the name or the dollars. It's something like that, some signal value that causes something to just separate from the pack. I also add, um, I think, you know, every investor is different. And y you need to do your homework and tailor right. your pitch to who you're pitching to. So you can't just go with, I think the best entrepreneurs have like 200 slide decks for 200 different pitches. <laughs> um, and <laughs> hopefully you don't have to do that many. But I think, um, I think part of that speaks to, I mean, we know when you're catering it to what we do, but that means that you've done the homework, you kind of mm -hmm. talk to people. I think it speaks highly of like your entrepreneurial nature. But I think you know if you pitch to BEV, you want to be able to articulate you know how many gigatons of CO2 you're going to be able to reduce. So I think doing your homework on the back end <laughs> and tailoring how you talk about your company to the person across the table is important. I think the numbers are worse in corporate than other businesses. Yeah. Um, because we have a sort of a Venn diagram of strategic and financial, and we have to find the intersection. Uh, that's a, uh, a much more difficult uh, process and, and uh, tends to be about 10x worse my, in my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, when we were doing uh, uh, th some of the work around 3D graphics uh, accelerators, we, we started with about 3,500 game companies and, and uh, weeded through those mm -hmm. to get to a couple to invest in. But uh, 1,500 to 1 is sort of the the wow. number that keeps popping for me as I do that, that similar math. Uh, but maybe, you know, it's just where you, s where you cut the pipeline. Mm -hmm. right. there's, a, there's a lot out there. That there's a lot of targets out there. So how do you, you know, out of 1,500, how do you become relevant? I think it's a, uh, you can't jump and up and down in my office. That's not going to work. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you, uh, but it's a long term. I think warm introduction from a board member is a, a a board that, that I'm on where another board member can talk to me about the deal, that's actually the best uh, uh, form for me. Uh, and the, uh, the time required to, to introduce a company to the business units and uh, obtain a, a strategic alignment there and vet your financials is longer with the, with the corporate. So be prepared for, for a, a longer process than you would ever get from a, um, a financial. And I think that, that also means it's a long-term relationship you're going to develop with the investor. Uh, so consider it a dialogue that may go through multiple rounds. If it's not a fit this round, it might be a fit in the future. So you're starting that, that dialogue. It's not a, uh, uh, um, it's not a, a, there's never a definite no in this game. There's only a definite yes. <laughs> to, to add to that, uh, try and talk to people before you need the money. Right. So you can you can have the, the I completely agree with the warm introductions and then the, the knowing what the investors are interested in, but you don't have to start the discussion when you're starting your Series A raise or your seed phase. It, it's very much a getting to know you, and we, we are also learning the markets too. Every time we look in a different technology space, we're starting from scratch. So if, if someone walks in the door and they can teach us something, 
from their past experiences, from what they're building. There's so much expertise in the room. It, it kind of takes a village. Consider that a dialogue. And th there's a lot of things across the desk, but people will pick up the phone or go for coffee if it's an area that the fund is interested in and start learning about you as a person and, and your company far, far before the, the Series A comes along. I'll also add on the whole dialogue. I would, I think, perhaps this, there's a spectrum of style, but I think at least my perspective is that um, a pitch is really much more of a conversation. Right. And so I think to the the worst pitches that I sit in are very robotic and like, regr like just saying everything as fast as possible to get to the end. Um, but the best ones just become more of a conversation about what you're working on, and so I think. Of course, having materials to help s support your story, et cetera, but I think um, realizing that it's much more of a conversation, a dialogue back and forth, than presenting your whole story up at one once um, is, I think, helpful for entrepreneurs. And then I think at least the way we approach it at the engine, too, is um, it's not really like a Shark Tank <coughs> experience where you have your one shot and <laughs> you have to get through it and you get a deal. It's much more of a ongoing yeah, series of conversations totally. where the first meeting might just be trying to figure out who you are, why you're working on that, and it's definitely a series of conversations that happen. Um, and we are happy to understand that, especially in the early phase, you're learning as you're going, and so like your story might change and pivot a little bit in that process, and that, that's okay. And to stress on what Ali said about learning who you are, like especially at these early stages of investing, like seed or Series A, there's a lot of technical risk. Right? You're betting on the management team. You're, right. you're betting on the people that you're meeting, that they're going to take whatever they have. There's going to be a, a lot of challenges ahead, but th they're going to be able to adapt and learn and change as they go. So getting to meet and okay, learn the people and connect with them is high on the list. <laughs> how you make a good impression. So hypothetically, you've spotted the gazelle, <laughs> you've started the conversation with the gazelle, and you're interested in learning about its tech and team. What's your diligence process like? Okay. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, so for, for Breakthrough Energy Ventures, we, we focus a lot on greenhouse gas emission reduction. That, that is our mission, that, that's why we're investing. Uh, so we have a, a strong technical team in our organization, like experts in energy storage, for example, or transportation things or, or buildings. So uh, spotted the gazelle. Uh, but uh, the early conversations tend to be technical of why do you think this technology can change this sector and what emission reductions do you think you can achieve under certain conditions and what's, what's the credible path for you to get from a battery cell in the lab to revolutionizing the utility industry and long duration storage, right? So that's, that's the technical story that we want to hear and that's BV's mandate. Uh, so that's, that tends to be the initial conversation. And once the technical discussions are, are progressing very well, that's when we start looking at business model and um, sales and how you approach customers and financials. Early and feel free to elaborate also on process. If you know, if you're in a regimented schedule, your well, team works one way. The thing is, it's gonna be different for everybody. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are investors that I know who, uh, frankly, do very little technical diligence. Although they invest in technical categories, they really look at who the co-investors are and then tend to trust them on many of these things. Uh, from a prime perspective, it's very much the opposite. You know, we are a, a deeply technical group. We really want to understand what things are and how they work. It's a feature, not a bug, when a presentation that, you know, uh, involves any kind of electrical or, you know, chemical transformation, any work function, uh, to see formulas in it. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. There are some people for whom that would be like a run screaming, oh my god, <laughs> what are you thinking? I think it goes to Ali's point beforehand that you need to have as much of an idea as you can uh, you know, with what is going to resonate and be able to adapt even during the discussion and follow where the heat is. You might listen to that and think, aren't you now judging me on my performance criteria, you know, rather than anything else? The answer is, what do you do as a CEO? You recruit. You recruit talent, you recruit customers, you recruit investors, you recruit partners. And 
that's all about you know, the skill in being able to prepare, communicate, understand, respond, adapt. Uh, so although it may seem a little theatrical of trying to understand what's going to resonate on the other side and kind of follow the heat in the discussion and you know, be able to respond to what diligence things you hear back, that's an audition that matters. You know, it's one that is a, a, a decent indicator, or at least historically has been a good indicator, of those same skills that an entrepreneur will use to be able to recruit talent and money and customers and other things. Um, so it, it, it's a big deal. But it's not something you can predict. Like, there is no formula for diligence that's going to differ as, for as many investors as there are in the world. All right, so you do mention some investors do like to look to other potential co-investors who've gone through diligence and who vetted the company. Some like to work in that way, some don't. But inevitably, we all do work with other investors. So how do you like to work with other investors? Uh, I share everything with other investors. I, I will share the entire pitch deck that I presented to my committee in order to bring particularly um, late in a round, if we're trying to fill out the final two investors or whatever and fill in five or seven million that is coming in from another place, um, I'll, I'll brief the partner and I'll set him up for the meeting on Monday. You know, on a Thursday, he's ready to go. And he's got a full deck and doesn't have to do anything because he can trust my diligence. And I'm, my background is very technical, so I tend to start from the technical side of things and, uh, and find something really unique about what's, uh, you know, what's on offer. Uh, for instance, this company we sold to Sony at Intel was called Gaikai, and they were the leader in cloud gaming. Mm -hmm. And they were the first company to actually stream H.264 video mm -hmm. from a data center uh, running computer games. And um, so uh, they were very unique. And I met Dave Perry in Los Angeles uh, right after he met uh, Rui and his other founder. And uh, I actually signed Rui's green card. <laughs> um, but, um, the, uh, but I knew within five minutes that, and Dave and I spent four hours chatting after that. Um, similarly with Climacell here in Boston, I met Shimon, and I, I can't stress how much you're betting on the CEO. Absolutely. When you're a board member and an investor, you have no other view into the company. You can't hire and fire C-levels, you can't hire and fire VPs, you can't go into development mm -hmm. and tweak the organization effectively. You, you're betting on that CEO to be able to do that for you. And um, um, within five minutes of meeting Climacell, I was uh, I knew I was going to invest in that company, just from what they uh, presented in, in that time. So it's, uh, it can be a very fast decision. One time, Lisa and Lambert and I were listening to an entrepreneur pitch, and it was 15 seconds in, and I said, I texted her, I said, this is, a, this is not a, this is a pass. And she said, I know it is. Let him talk for three minutes so he feels good. <laughs> <laughs> but so it can be very snap in, in the pitch itself. So the one thing I would mention on this front that it is going to differ by stage and will differ a lot by investor. Um, you know, from Prime's front, we, we are structured as a 501c3 nonprofit, right? So we have a philanthropic mission that is to bring capital that's on the sidelines uh, to enable breakthrough climate innovation. And there are really two things that we think about. You know, number one, we, we have a purpose. It's greenhouse gas mitigation. But the other is that we're not just trying to bring technologies to life. We're trying to bring talent to life. Because you know there are young entrepreneurs who have to choose on the bubble, you know, where, where are they going to devote their energies, and we want them to be focused on hard problems. So we are very explicitly and unabashedly pro-entrepreneur. If we have to pick sides, we're on your side, right? And that manifests itself in real ways. I mean, to give you an example from this week, there is a round that we're leading. It's a two million dollar round. Uh, it's in a hard tech company in a kind of neglected industrial category, not from a coastal tech center, like in the middle of the country. Uh, we are pricing and leading and doing a million bucks in that round, and we were bringing together the other million dollars from our network. Another venture firm popped in and expressed interest and said, hey, we may want to go alongside you. Uh, that was great. We have a couple conversations with the management team and them. Uh, my partner, Johanna Wolfson, sends out an email to the CEO and that other investor saying, hey, we're only raising two. We've already got interest at you know, significantly more than uh, you know, the one that we're doing. If you know, this other firm is going to do one, we'll need to expand the size of the round. And that means we'll need to revisit some things, right? That's going to change the cap table. We'll have to decide what we do. 
that other you know investor then sends a message back, but now like the CEO and the CTO of the company have been removed from the CC line, and it's just us. And it's like, well, let's get together and decide what deal we're giving the entrepreneur. And we're like, forget that. We're not going to collude, right? And then come back and eliminate the entrepreneur's ability to do price discovery and you know figure out what is going to work well for them and what is market. And you will find great divergence, you know, between how pro entrepreneur, uh, you know, versus kind of pro investor, uh, you know, early stage investors' terms and attitude is. Personally, I involved the the CEO in that discussion from start to finish. Yeah. And at the end of the process, if if we don't see eye to eye on valuation, which is the last thing in the process, um, we've done something wrong. Right. I actually want them to suggest to me the valuation that I have in mind. And I want them to do that based on uh, models that we have developed together about their valuation, about their future valuation, and their exit potential, and, and what stage they're at right now. And if we can agree on, on that, then um, those figures are usually mit missing from pitch decks, by the way. They, that's what we do when we go to committee, is fill out the re rest of the pitch deck, right? Well, I do that with the CEOs so that they can see the process. And I usually share the deck with them fully so that there's transparency. I don't, I don't need surprises with them. Because it's a trust, there's a trust relationship there. I think trust and transparency are very key in all of this. So whether or not every investor is going to be as open with their data room and their diligence as your team is, Odds are investors are talking to each other if they have heard you pitch. I mean, you've heard folks emphasize that the warm introduction is so important. So odds are someone is speaking on your behalf and you know there's, there's some sort of dialogue going on about your, your uh, company and the investor community. So it's important to keep that in the back of your mind, though um, you know, a, a lot of us really are very entrepreneur friendly and we're not necessarily trying to go and negotiate things on the side with potential investors. So hypothetically, we get to the point where now we're at deal time. We're going to make an investment. Oftentimes, terms need to be discussed. So let's do a quick rapid fire raise of hands for the panel. Uh, do you go into seed rounds? Series A. We have a team that does that. I'm on, ah. the, I'm on the CEC side, but there's an early stage team that does that. Post or Series B or after? Who here leads? Anyone want to talk about what it means to lead? Leading is uh, <laughs> where you're probably putting the largest check into the deal. You're probably pulling the syndicate together, and you're probably specifying the uh, primary terms. Uh, but you can trade those off uh, if you want to trade off you know, different kinds of preferences for valuation and things like that in the, uh, it depends on where people get stuck. That's why I do valuation last is because I don't like people to get stuck mm -hmm. um, on, on certain things. And you can get people posturing about different terms and they'll, and they'll get stuck uh, somewhere. And, you know, it's got to be 20 on 80 or something. And if it's got to be in that territory and you can't make the other math that we talked about earlier work, then you have to play games with other uh, preferences uh, and other terms to, um, uh, and, and those can be egregious. They can be really uh, nasty if you put in like valuation ratchets post round and things like that that are uh, uh, very non standard terms. But, but if you got stuck in the wrong place, then you, you can't fix it any other way. So, um, and you also anyway. have cases where you could be collating, where you're, you're talking to multiple investors, there's good alignment between two parties that you're talking to, or there, there's a large round that you're trying to raise, and there, there's synergies for both the investors and the companies to actually have a colleague. Yeah, yeah and I, I think the syndication aspect of your lead investor is so important. Make sure that if your round is not already fully subscribed, talk to your investors about help syndicating the deals. Odds are they know more investors than you do um, and can potentially make some suggestions as to who is worthwhile talking to and maybe who you, which tree you should not be barking up. So going back to the raise of hands quickly, who does safes? Wow. Who wants to describe what? Does everyone? Yeah. Let's do a description of a safe. 
simple agreement mm -hmm. for future <laughs> equity. So <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh, basically a, a loan instrument uh, without a, a repayment period that converts to equity as soon as you raise your Series A, but no repayment requirement. Who does convertible notes? We have to. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about late stage bridge loans. Yes, <laughs> yeah, we have. To, sometimes you have to do those things, and you know it comes down to uh, raise money when you don't need it. And uh, I'm a dry powder guy. I'm like a raise as much as possible, put it in the bank, mm -hmm. and uh, and then we don't have to talk about that because it's, it's just distracting to a CEO to be out every six months, you know, on the road. It takes a long time to raise around, and it's it distracts from the business. So if you if you wait too long and then you have to go to your uh, existing investors to be bridged, that's a very painful uh, process. And then it th sets you up badly for, the, for going out for a raise then, because you, you already got money that you spent that's going to roll over into the round. Suddenly you got a $20 million round with $10 million new. That doesn't look very good. So. But that's in the context <sighs> of a existing. later yeah. stage yeah. bridge yeah. round. Yeah. Does yeah. anyone bridge do loans, an yeah. earlier stage convertible note? Want to talk about? We tend Why to do space for notes when it's a smaller dollar amount of an investment, um, mm -hmm. just because the, you know, for a smaller investment, it doesn't necessarily um, warrant all of the costs of doing the full financial um, equity round. But I, our, our preference is to do equity because we think it's the most clear and there's a clearest understanding of how much you're selling, how much you have as a founder. But I think. Um, for the smaller, on the smaller check size, we write checks anywhere between 200,000 and up to 4 million. And for the smaller end, we think it, we've done safes and convertible notes that feel more appropriate. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, I don't know how we are on time. I realize there's no clock. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> OK, great. So I want to leave enough time for questions. I realize that the question cards are up here and have not been circulated. So I don't know if anyone wants to help circulate those, pass them around. Um, but a couple of final questions that I'll put out there. Uh, first, what, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen companies make during the fundraising process? And uh, we're all open to horror stories and anecdotes and the worst of the worst. Um, I think uh, founders arguing amongst each other in front of the investors is probably not a <laughs> best practice. Um, but I, I think that the main thing is, um, yeah, pitching without reading the room on when people have questions or like going down a path that the investors seem interested in. I think just forcing forcing a pitch that isn't resonating is sort of when it, it, it falls short. Um, and then I just say, I think um, in emails, the two-page emails <laughs> are probably more difficult to digest, <laughs> I think, as well. <laughs> so I think to the, I understand that for most of you, you're developing more complex technologies. You need to articulate what you're doing. But I think to the, uh, if you can do that in a brief way to catch people's interest, I think that's most effective. No, I think that's a great point. If it does not fit on the first screen of a smartphone, it probably isn't going to get read. Um, the, the big thing for me, actually, is, is, is interpersonal founder dynamics. And I think there are two dimensions to that that you know, I've, I've seen as a common kind of tripping up thing. One of them is having you know, multiple founders where there's not clarity on roles. You know, if two people show up and say we're co-founding and you're like, all right, you know, is one of you the CEO and one of you the CTO? And it's like, well, not really. We're both going to do most things. That tends to end poorly. Uh, you know, and, and I'm sure that there are, you know, teams that have and will continue to pull it off. But just like empirically, you know, the balance of cases where everybody was equal, uh, you know, versus the buck stop somewhere is probably 100 to 1, um, you know, in, in favor of having clear roles. So that's one. The other one, though, even if roles are clear, is different versions of success. Uh, you know, so you might, we, we encounter this commonly where there are like, you know, two or three people who work together in a lab and then a business founder who may have joined them. And uh, you know they look around the table and, and have a high degree of equanimity, but their their view of success is very different. You know, for one of them, it is I want to put two or three million bucks in the bank, maybe in an early outcome that you know marks me and my family as safe and gives me the ability to uh, you know take on more risk in the next thing I do in my career. And the co-founder's version of success may be ringing the bell on the Nasdaq. Period. 
and their view of like how to raise money and to do what and what a successful outcome looks like will be so radically different that it's extremely unlikely they're going to agree, and therefore it's extremely unlikely they're going to still be working together a couple of years from then, which is a death knell. You know, they, there's no replacement for the founder's zeal. Um, the, the advice I often give to entrepreneurial teams is like go out for drinks together and have two drinks. Not one. With one, you may not be fully open. Not three, <laughs> then you may not be in control of what you're saying, but two <laughs> is the optimal number of drinks and look each other in the eye and tell each other what success is. And if there's material difference in your view, like 45 degree difference or more in your view, you, you probably need to go back to the drawing board a little bit. It's, it's probably worth understanding also that <coughs> financial VCs also have limited partners. And uh, they have to go pitch the limited partners just like you have to pitch them. And they have to raise money from them. And I've talked to multiple uh, people in that industry uh, who uh, say that it's, that was the hardest process the, to, to you know, raise a $150 million fund uh, from LPs. And it took them you know, three years on the road of uh, you know, talking to investors to raise that kind of money. So it's not just you. You know, it's not just the entrepreneur who has a lot of pitching to do to raise uh, capital. So, you know, be prepared for a lot of pitches. You know, that's, it's still, it's a dialogue. Start the dialogue. You're going to have that dialogue with a lot of people. And uh, I, I think really, you know, to, to get back to your question about, about um, what did people do wrong, I think they, they misread uh, the match between their business plan and the propensity of the investor to to invest in it. So I s sometimes I see companies that are uh, not ready to raise, uh, and they're and they're trying to raise an A, or they're uh, trying to position it as a B when it's really an A plus, and it's uh, it's just not ready for a, a for for B time yet. And um, that's uh, you can't get by those things. You know those are they aren't necessarily their problem. It's just where they've ended up. You know it's. But you know, not having product market fit and trying to raise a C, that's a problem. The other thing we see, especially on seed and Series A companies, is that, that they come in the room and they, they're trying to sell very hard. That we, we know everything. Or who's your competitor? There is no competitor. Mm -hmm. We're the only ones in the space. So, or what's your IP position? We filed their A to get grant. Uh, this is a hard space. So we, we all know that there, there are things that the founders don't know yet or, or haven't uh, fully thought through or haven't had the time or the money to, to fully execute. And there's much better appreciation when people say that it's challenging, we've done this much, and we think there is further we need to do to solve this problem or answer your question, versus a, a team that comes in and, and says we have 100% of the solution, because that's, that's not the case. So be careful of, of overpitching. I think I, early I, stage um, hasn't, they haven't gone to a trade show yet. They don't even know the that they're going to end up at NAB or they're going to end up at CES in a hall mm -hmm. with 150 IoT companies that look pretty much like them mm -hmm. that are selling, you know, and, and, and they actually don't know this yet. It's because they haven't, you know, put their head up and looked around and said, who do I actually, who am I going to end up competing with? That's actually um, relates quite well if I can find mm -hmm. the right question. Um, starting audience questions now. So if you have them, the clipboards are floating around. How important is it for a company seeking, I imagine this says funds, <laughs> to consider what the market price is for a similar company in the field? Quite I think, important. So uh, I can see we had this experience happen um, with a recently we invested in the company recently in this. I think it, as an entrepreneur, you should certainly do your homework and understand what the market is for your industry to see okay. whether you're like on par or not. But yeah. I also think um, in our instance, we sort of had the <coughs> belief that you know too high of a valuation too early actually sets your company up for mm -hmm. a hard road down, down in your next two rounds. Um, because you need to increase that uh, tremendously. And so I think, I think you should be armed with that data to understand you know, what's happening in, in your space, but also recognize that um, I think you know, we take the approach that you know, if you can get a better deal, like 
by all means, go do that. It's in your best interest. Um, but I think it's always a, a conversation, at least from the investor standpoint, of um, not truly trying to understand what your company is worth, per se, but what is the valuation that will make sense for the bucket of work that you're doing, and how does that set you up for the next two or three buckets of work? Because I think it's really hard when you're in your third round and you have to deal with a down round because it was priced super high at the early stage. And so I think the increments matter. Um, so thinking a couple of steps ahead mm -hmm. is important. I totally agree. So you find a company you're interested in investing in, the syndicate has not been pulled together yet. Why don't investors take the entire round if they believe in the business? So <laughs> m more things I have strong feelings about. Um, <laughs> You know, one of them is, I think there are three reasons. Uh, you know, one of them is it's a check. You know, it's social proof. Uh, there are times when you have such high conviction that you are purely motivated, uh, you know, to go and go fast. You're a purely financial investor. You're motivated by greed. In general, you know, why do you have partners? You have partners to make sure you don't make stupid decisions. Um, you know, why do you have co-investors? There's an element of social proof in that. Uh, you know, a second one, though, that I think is a far bigger deal, and it matters to the CEO. If you're the CEO, and you, which happens like half the time, right? You'd plan to raise this amount of money to do these things at these value inflection milestones and raise the next round at an uptick. Half the time, you don't hit those numbers, mm -hmm. right? Like reality intervenes. Something didn't work. You're asking the wrong questions. There was a downturn in your industry. Customer took longer than you expected. And you're looking around the table and saying, OK, well, we now need to do an inside bridge. And our existing investors need to pony up a little more cash. You do not want to be turning to one wallet. What if there's a surprise? What if they're at the end of their fund? What if whatever? You want at least two or three people uh, you know, that you can turn to to have that discussion. And that's out of pure entrepreneurial self-interest. So it's not that maybe the investor doesn't want that. It's that you don't want that. Uh, and then the third aspect of it is, you know, again, from the entrepreneur's perspective, if the money that you're providing is just money, if, if the money that you are raising is just money, that may be entirely true. And again, in difficult areas to raise money in, any port in a storm. You may not have this luxury. But if you do, and your choice is between doing something all with one investor or with multiples, you want to have multiple networks open to you that are non-overlapping. You want to have multiple sources of feedback from people who don't have the same biases to test you and sharpen you and make your decision stronger. You, know, you want to have multiple routes to an introduction at the customer, multiple routes to the person you want to hire. You know, there's a point where that gets unwieldy, like having four or five investors in a seed round, probably a bad idea. It's too much for you to manage. You've got to focus. But, you know, we're two better than one, three better than two, maybe. Beyond that, it can get, get a little more unwieldy. I was going to add one more reason on the investor side, because you, you might be raising a two, three million dollar seed round today, but you need to raise a 20 million dollar Series A round. Right. So if you're the investor, you want someone in there with you to pick up the load, not just for this round, but the right. one after. <laughs> so that's uh, another way of looking at it. When you're thinking, oh, this is a small round, this fund can do it, look about the size of the fund and how can they follow on in future rounds. And I know that at Massey, you see, we're very hands-on investors. So the more investors around the table, the more hands-on deck to help during some of those challenging times. One of the questions was whether or not we do help the companies that we work with help recruit and find talent. Uh, we're constantly getting job descriptions from our companies that are trying to hire. So the more investors at the table, the more hands on deck you have. And going back to something that Matthew said and also something that you commented on in terms of bridges, everyone always seems to need some sort of follow on or a bridge. I get that you might be coming in and saying this is going to be your last equity raise or there's only going to be one more, but uh, the the trend seems to be that you do need that follow on and having that additional dry powder of more investors can be can be really critical. Um, and, and also commenting on uh, the importance of having diversity of investors, someone posed the... Well, a, a really good example there is uh, Filament out in uh, Reno, Nevada. They're in the blockchain space and um, uh, JetBlue Ventures is in, in that, Verizon is in that, uh, Intel's in that. And uh, we, uh, each of them brings something entirely different to the company. And JetBlue is also an investor in Climacell because weather data is really important to airlines. And Ford Motor Company invested in this last round because weather data is really important to self-driving vehicles. And uh, 
national grid invested because weather data is important to our operations as well. So there's these different verticals, and these represent entrees for the company into uh, new markets. So transportation, uh, aviation, and utilities are now open to, uh, to the company through the involvement of multiple strategics. And that's, that's unusual. It's not an Andreessen-led round. Um, but you know, Andreessen is entirely the other situation. They typically write the entire check and, uh, and wouldn't allow anyone else in the room. So on diversity of investors, and you happen to be a corporate, so I'll direct this one at you. Uh-oh. Um, but everyone else can come in as well. Uh, how should entrepreneurs thinking about, think about the importance of or how they signal uh, having corporate strategic investors involved in a round and not just financial investors? So what is the importance? How is it perceived? It's very often, so, so corporates that lead are un unusual except for Intel Capital which sort of wrote the book on that and um, and National Grid is following in that because everyone there is from Intel Capital um, so uh, we believe there's uh, there's a power in in uh, in being able to lead the investment whether you co-lead it or not uh, being able to step up and set the price um, that that puts you at parity the I guess it's really important that you not be misaligned with the financial investors. And I think that's the, that's the real key, is that everyone in the room has to be aligned. And so you have to behave as a financial investor. And that means you have to, uh, you have to uh, follow on with uh, bridges. You have to be able to participate pro rata in future rounds. You have to be able to, uh, if you led, if you, uh, on the rounds you came in at, very likely, uh, you'd be leading that round. So I think um, um, one issue with coming in early on a Series A, uh, this actually happened to me at Intel Capital. As a corporate, we're not allowed to reprice our own holdings. So I couldn't actually lead the A after, after putting mm -hmm. 500K into the seed of uh, a company in San Francisco. Uh, with the intent of leading the A, I couldn't mark that up as a, a corporate investor. And we had to find an external financial lead to uh, price that round. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, that's the real big red flag, is that most people think that if you got corporates in, they can't set the price, so you have to go find a, a financial to set the price. But I think if you can get past that, um, you know, then you have the right people in the room. And you know, the people I've worked with at JetBlue, at uh, Verizon, and at, uh, here at National Grid and at Intel, they, um, they know what they're doing. On the on the corporate venture capital side, it's also important. It's even more important to understand what's driving them and whether they are on the financial end of the spectrum, like National Grid and, and Intel Capital, or whether they're more strategic and they're doing it because they want to have access to new technology. They want to have access to innovation. There's a particular product that they have in mind that they want to use the the technology in, because that's that can lead to either misalignment with the other investors or the timing of when you want to bring them in the round might change. So if, you, if you're at a point where you want to grow uh, de product development and sales, you're, you're past the proof of concept, you, you think you have your prototype, you want help to, to productize it and sell, and you have a strategic across the table that wants to introduce this into a market through one of their channels, it makes sense. You bring that strategic too early before you've built your first prototype, before you've set your requirements or target requirements, it might change the development plan in an area where the company wouldn't have gone otherwise and close off other markets. So timing uh, and what the, the interests of the strategics are, are are important. If you, if you um, look at strategics, you can probably see some that are looking at acquisitions. Mm -hmm. And so they look at an investment in a startup as an incremental acquisition. Um, one of the terms they might ask for is a uh, right of first refusal on your exit. And um, you want to push back on that. And I've been on the yeah, both sides of that table. And uh, you want to say no to that. Uh, as a board member at the company, you want to at most give them information uh, that there is an offer and that they can counter in the next uh, five days or something like that. A very short window to counter. But you don't want to uh, uh, you don't want to get in a situation where the valuation is pre-negotiated, uh, 
or whether the where the identity of the um, of the buyer is disclosed. For instance, if it was you know Juniper, Cisco, Huawei, or somebody like that, you don't want to get involved with that with uh, disclosure of the identity or the or the even the amount of the offer. Just there's been an offer that has been made. So information rights is what I limit that to. So switching gears a little bit, I think we potentially have some budding investors in the audience. So I'm going to ask for all investor participation. If you could kindly raise your hand if you are an investor. Now, lower your hand if you have, if you do not have an MBA. So Sorry. there are two, three <laughs> investors in the room that have MBAs. Four. OK, so raise your hand if you are an investor and you have prior finance experience. That's about three. OK, raise your hand if you have prior entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial support experience and you are an investor. OK, so judging by the volumes, the question was, if you want to work in clean tech VC, which experience is most valuable? Just pulling the audience right there, it looks like entrepreneurial experience or entrepreneurial support. A lot of us do not have MBAs. A lot of us have no prior experience in finance. Uh, but you can get your foot in the door with all of those three things. Um, and others as well, I think also technical chops are really important. Um, and a related question, is there upward mobility within VC? There's just exits. There's just <laughs> <laughs> we actually had this problem at Intel Capital, is that uh, you, you invest, um, you have exits, but there's no, uh, the hierarchy of investments, uh, of, of uh, investment teams uh, are simply that there's a, uh, is a committee that approves things, and then after that, you know, there's some finance people that keep track of what's uh, HR people and things. You don't want to get promoted, promoted to that. Doing deals is actually the best part of this job. Meeting entrepreneurs, meeting all of you, uh, having that dialogue about uh, technologies and companies and what's, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, it's, you know, we're inventing the future, and uh, that's good enough for me. But that's, you know, a couple of good exits, and I, I feel like I've been promoted. <laughs> So a couple of targeted questions, one for Matthew. You said your investors accept more risk but expect more reward. What is the target uh, rate of return that they expect? Interesting. Um, I, I should rephrase. Our, our investors will expect more risk. They expect more impact. Uh, you know, bear in mind, if you were an early stage investor and you are unable to follow on because you don't have a huge fund, what does that mean? Well, if you look at the history of you know, even very successful companies that have gone public, uh, in these hard tech categories, they tend to have you know a hiccup along the way. There tends to be a surprise, uh, you know, where a company has what's called a down round, where you raise money at a lower share price in the next round than the previous, or in some cases a recapitalization, which is where you kind of start over, uh, you know, you kind of wipe the slate clean and start over with whoever can show up and put more money in. And what does that mean? It means if you were an early stage investor and you don't have you know dry powder, as you'd put it beforehand, uh, to participate in that round, it can be dangerous to you. You know, as a seed fund that's very small and focused on early stage rounds, we don't have the ability to do that. We only want to back companies that we think can have extraordinary climate impact. One of the risks our investors are taking on is that one of the companies in our portfolio could be very successful, but we might not enjoy the fruits of its labor. Uh, because we might have a company that goes through one of these crises, doesn't raise up every time, and we may not have dry powder to be able to put in. Uh, so I would think about that. Um, outside of that point, which is probably unique to us, you know, as a mission-oriented fund, uh, is that in general, you know, risk and return are, are, you know, the opposite of one another, right? You can go out and buy treasury bills. They have a yield rate. They're backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, and they are not going to make you wealthy overnight. Uh, you know, on the other hand, at the opposite extreme of that, you know, would be internet seed funds that will invest in 100 companies, have 90 failures, nine cases where you make your money back, and one company that is 10,000x and makes the fund, right? Uh, you know, I would think that in these hard tech categories at the seed stage, it's probably one more click out, you know, of risk reward. You're buying early shares at a very low price. If you have a company that's able to produce benign base load power, match supply and demand on the grid, uh, you know, secure water independence, let's not fool ourselves. That's going to be historically valuable, lucrative, important, independent, enduring company. Uh, it will be worth a lot. But you know the number of uh, the, the percentage wins out of the hole is going to be lower than it is in fields where you know earlier and you know on less money. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Um, and talking about impact a little bit more, Christina, the half a gigaton of GHD abatement, that it, uh, does that pertain to the U.S. market only or globally because different countries have varying emissions rates? That's true. So let me, let me clarify. We, we're putting that n number out there to say that we're targeting large problems. Right. Uh, and it is based on worldwide emissions. It is based on 1% of the global emissions projected by 2050, which is approximately 50 gigatons. So that's where it comes from. Um, so it is on a global scale, because uh, we think this is a global problem. Uh, and it is considering a very large adoption of whatever technology we're looking at. We, we know that a small single company probably will never reach that target. But would that technology class or technology to scales reach that target? Uh, so I have to call myself out on the next one because apparently I asked questions and as an investor did not answer myself. <laughs> so <laughs> at Mass CEC, we do have a sweet spot and that is seed and series A investments. So we will go later stage. We do equity, we do convertible notes, and we do venture debt. Um, and our criteria is that you have to be based in Massachusetts and have some sort of measurable uh, clean energy impact that is uh, substantial. We don't have the same threshold, but we like to see uh, tens of millions of tons of GHG emissions um, avoided per year due to your solution. So, Great. I got the five minute mark, so a couple more questions. And some of these are excellent questions. So good that I want to end with them so that they're discussion topics during the networking. Um, but quick yes, no from everyone. Should founders tailor their ask, so their check size, to the investor that they are talking to? Yes. I think I say no. <laughs> I think the amount of money that you're raising should be based on the roadmap and milestone, milestone plan that you think puts your company at the next value inflection point. So that shouldn't depend on what the investors can write. It's more figuring out your plan and then mapping which investors Makes sense yeah. for that plan. Which investors make sense? Yeah. yeah. You don't ask the ones that are, don't write the right checks. <laughs> yeah. We totally failed the lightning round yes no thing. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. It's laughs> unable to process in binary terms. It's challenging. See, you can never just get you a straight answer out of it. Yeah. Email back, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so given that we do have um, only five minutes left, I want to ask everyone on the panel for kind of concluding thoughts. So, do you have? Any final word of advice or a gem of wisdom that you can be so kind to impart on all of us? <laughs> I'm supposed to go first on that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think I don't, I'm new to this world, but I mean, I think the I just encourage you to keep working on what you're working on. I mean, I think the world's biggest problems are in the physical world, and unfortunately, the traditional venture system was optimized for the digital world. And I think you have four folks here who care a lot about what you're working on, and I think I just want to be optimistic and say, you know, what you're doing is important, and we care. I, I would say get, get out there and talk to as many people as you can. <coughs> other founders that have started companies from the ground up, uh, other inventors in lab that may have interesting technology that might combine with what you're doing, investors, corporates, just try and network as much as possible because within the energy industry, it's, it's already a pretty small space and you, you'll find connections and way path, path forward. I'm very, very new to National Grid, about five months in now. So uh, new to the energy space from the IT sector as well. But I think that it's a very exciting time in energy. And I think uh, utility companies are looking for solutions to, uh, to modernize their operations and to, to bring renewables online. And everything you folks are working on in the energy space is uh, important to the future. So uh, engage, with, uh, engage with us. and. Uh, let's see if we can get it into production. So look, be, being an entrepreneur is hard. You know, you are the man or the woman in the arena. It's your blood, your sweat, and your tears. And man, everybody in the stands is a critic. Uh, you know, everybody in the ground is a critic, right? Your team may second guess your decisions. 
Uh, you know, everybody's offering you advice. It's rarely compatible. It's sometimes conflicting, uh, often conflicting. And because, you know, people who tend to go out and start and do new things want to achieve excellence, there can be a push to try to integrate every piece of feedback to please everybody to whatever. The answer is that's not the way the world works. You know, and that's not how history gets written. You know, it doesn't happen by pleasing people or checking their boxes. It happens when there are bold people who can suspend disbelief and who meld the world to match their will. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go out and talk to lots of people and get input. You totally should. It doesn't mean you shouldn't listen, you know, to team members when they're like, hey, are you, you know, smoking something up there, dude? Like, rethink that. But it does mean that you should take what works for you and reject what doesn't. You know, and when you go out and run your pitch past five or six people and they're all telling you different things, what find find what gives you energy and power. Find what makes you feel authoritative, uh, you know, and sparks your synapses and makes your blood rush and lean hard into that. You know, that's going to be the best and strongest version of yourself. That's going to compel people to open their wallets to you. It's going to compel people to join your team. It's going to compel customers to listen to you. Uh, and none of this stuff happens without you. You know, you are the motor that moves the world. Uh, you deserve, you know, respect and a degree of reverence, you know, when you succeed and when you fail. And uh, bear that in mind. Do what works for you. Great. Um, and just a couple of final thoughts. Don't forget the importance of non-dilutive funding. Go after that. Know your investor and try to get warm introductions. Uh, be patient. Wait for the right investor. Um, going back to the initial comments that everyone made on this panel, um, Matthew pointed out, if you're risky, if you're early, if you're tough tech, then don't worry. There is the right investor out there for you. You just need to find that one. Ali pointed out that if you have friction points with which every early stage company does, if you need lab space, if you need equipment or tools, then find someone to help because there are resources out there that can help with that. Um, you know, uh, Christina really emphasized that you want to seek support from value add investors. So if you're fortunate enough to find multiple right fits, then make sure that you are going after those investors with the appropriate operational expertise and technical expertise that can actually support you. Um, and when it comes to corporate relationships and uh, strategic investors, make sure that you're actually aligned. Don't assume their priorities. Do your homework. And if you have anything smart related, please talk <laughs> to Patrick <laughs> after this panel. Um, and uh, the final questions that I do want to leave everyone with, which hopefully we can all talk about over networking, is um, what do we all think the electrical grid will look like in 10 years? And what changes have we each made in our own individual lives or at our companies to reduce our climate impact? Um, so with that, I want to thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Um, it, we wouldn't be here without all the entrepreneurs that have the great ideas. So uh, thank you to the panel, and thank you to everyone.